welcome to this latest installment of the Strauss Center <coughs> Speaker Series. My name is Mark Lawrence. I teach in the History Department, but it's my good fortune to be closely associated with this Strauss Center where people like Frank and Jeremy and Celeste, who I don't see here today, and Jessica do all the hard work of putting on this series. I get to swoop in and have the spotlight here for just a couple of minutes here. Um, and it's really my great pleasure today to have that spotlight because I get to introduce um, a really extraordinary scholar who's written a really extraordinary book that she's going to, I think, tell us about today. Um, Hang, is, Hang Nguyen is a wonderful, talented, and extraordinary scholar in many, many different ways. I have to say, on a personal note, she's an old friend, and it's wonderful to see her here. For that reason, I think we go back to about the mid-1990s in, in New Haven and had a Vietnam War study group, and I don't know what else we did back then, but, uh, but we talked a lot about the Vietnam War. No, no, maybe. <laughs> Um, but I think the more important thing to say about Hang is that she is an extraordinarily energetic scholar. She, long before this book appeared, had produced a really important series of articles on various aspects of the Vietnam War, uh, articles that I have to say I drew on heavily in trying to write a synthetic uh, survey of the Vietnam War a few years ago. I think I found her work as useful as anybody's work um, in trying to make sense, especially of the Vietnamese side of the war. She's written an extraordinary number of reviews and book chapters, you name it. Um, Hang has, uh, has done it. Um, and in the process, uh, become really one of the very most important uh, scholars of the Vietnam War. And I would even say beyond that, one of the most important contributors to the so-called new Cold War history, that is to say, uh, Cold War history that draws especially on uh, communist bloc sources and tries to tell the story of the Cold War, not from traditional American, West European sources, but from uh, places where for a long, long time it was much, much harder to get um, research materials. But the real reason she's here, of course, is not any of that, but is this book that appeared uh, earlier this year, 2012, uh, Hanoi's War, International History of the War for Peace in Vietnam. Pathbreaking, I think, is a word that's very much overused in the academic world, but this is, I think, a book that merits that adjective. Um, as many of you know, the Vietnam War, like so many Cold War stories, was told uh, almost ex exclusively over the years, necessarily on the basis of Western sources, especially American sources. Uh, in recent times, historians have had some access to Chinese, Soviet, and especially Vietnamese material to begin to tell the story in different ways. And I would go so far as to say that this is the most important book that has yet appeared that tries to tell the story of the Vietnam War in new ways. I won't go beyond that. I think Hang's going to summarize it, but tell us uh, about the book and hit on some of the highlights um, today. But um, uh, let me just uh, hold this beautiful book up in front of you and uh, tell you that it's published by UNC Press. And it's easily uh, uh, available, and hopefully this talk will inspire some of you to, to go out and uh, get it if you don't already have it. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, my friends and associate professor at the University of Kentucky, Hang Nguyen. Is my friend and my agent. <laughs> so before I begin, I'd just like to thank Frank Gavin, uh, Liz Settler, Jess Mahoney for bringing me here today and making this, this trip such a pleasure. I mean, it, for me to be able to present um, in front of so many great Cold War historians, Jeremy Suri, uh, Mark Lawrence, um, and others, is and you know it's, it's such a treat uh, for someone um, in my field. So although this year marks the 50th anniversary of the start of the Vietnam War, it continues to resonate today. I think I think everyone here in this room would agree with me when I say that. With the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Vietnam War is going through a second, and one can argue perhaps a third life. Um, and, oh, there was, here, this clicker. Thank you. <laughs> so during the Bush administration, as we know, Louis Sorley's A Better War circulated in the Pentagon, and it was rumored that while in Obama's first term, Golden Gordstein's Lessons in Disaster made its way to the president's nightstand. Both administration, uh, both administrations, it appears, sought solutions to America's current wars through the historical lessons of Vietnam's past. The presidents were not alone in keeping the Vietnam War relevant. The media, political pundits, 
and former officials constantly evoked the lessons of the war as these headlines show you can peruse them yourself. But there's a problem, I say, to these current references to Vietnam. Not only are Iraq and Afghanistan, not Vietnam, as we well know, making historical analogies difficult and unwieldy, but a more fundamental issue exists, I think. I basically argue that I think we have an incomplete and at times even faulty understanding of the Vietnam War. And this is really surprising given the number of studies on this conflict that now, uh, to my count, surpasses that of even the American Civil War. And if you look at the amount of dissertations um, and even and prospectuses, I don't think that number is going to slow down anytime soon. Let's look at the field uh, a bit more carefully. The strongest subset within the field is the history of US policy toward Vietnam. Thanks to excellent studies of presidential <coughs> and high-level decision-making, such as those by some in this very room, Mark Lawrence, um, whose work is devoted to this topic, as well as Jeremy Sori and Frank Gavins, whose scholarship touch on Vietnam as well, we now have a deeper understanding of the origins and nature of US intervention in Vietnam. This is, by far, I think, the, the strongest subset of studies within the Vietnam War literature. Not as robust um, as the body of, of, of literature on US decision making, there have also been impressive works on the international dimensions of the Vietnam War in recent years, and in particular, some scholars with the re requisite language skills have benefited from the opening of archives in Beijing and Moscow uh, to present the international communist perspective of the Vietnam War. Lagging far behind US diplomatic and even international histories is the state of wars, uh, the state of, of, of works on the war in area studies. Vietnam specialists have long avoided focusing on um, on this period, and this isn't surprising when you think about it. Setting out to prove that Vietnam was more than a war, but a country with its own long history, these scholars have focused on the period before 1955 and after 1975, omitting those crucial 20 years um, that I think have done more to shape modern Vietnam than any other uh, event. But there has been one exception, I think, and that's US relations with South Vietnam, where inroads have been made, and uh, I think UT Austin's own Helen uh, will contribute uh, to this trend uh, with what will be her path-breaking dissertation. So basically, we have an excellent understanding of top-level decision-making in the US, a good grasp of the international Cold War context, and even a burgeoning awareness of the Saigon government uh, during the war. But what about Hanoi? What about the Vietnamese Communist War effort and the nature of the leadership in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV, or, or North Vietnam? Of course, we all know this man. I think the vast majority of studies on the Vietnamese Communist War effort place Ho Chi Minh at the front and center of Hanoi's war. Without access to the internal party documents, these early studies had no choice but to echo the official line coming from Hanoi at the time and also afterwards that Uncle Ho, Bac Ho, led the party, and that even after his death in 1969, his comrades in the Politburo continued to carry out his teachings and lead the willing Vietnamese masses, both north and south of the 17th parallel, to victory. But I contend that this focus on Ho doesn't get us any closer to understanding Hanoi's war. Instead, it's this man, this man right here, who's off to the side of Ho a bit, who should be the focus of our attention. General Secretary Le Yun, or Le Zun. This picture, which accompanied my New York Times op-ed, captures, I think, Le Zuan's leadership style, lacking the charisma necessary to stand forth and lead the most visible national liberation struggle taking place on the world stage at that time. He chose to stay out of the limelight to allow others, in this case, the grandfather Li Ho Chi Minh, to stand forth instead. What I'd like to do today is shine the spotlight on Le Yung and reveal a rather different story than the one we're used to. By analyzing the policies of the true mastermind behind Hanoi's war, my book shows that peace never had a chance because Le Zuan was intent on total victory. Driven by domestic political needs as well as international pressure, my central argument is that Le Zuan and his coterie of deputies and the party were determined to pay any price to reunify the country under Hanoi's rule. At the same time, I argue that the Nixon administration was intent on using the negotiations to guarantee the survival of a non-communist South Vietnam rather than produce a viable peace, 
com combined with the Saigon regime's goal of prolonging the war and slowing down U.S. withdrawal to ensure its survival, peace then never had a chance. But in the interest of time, and I want to save a lot of time uh, for Q&A, I won't focus on the Nixon administration or the Nguyen Thanh Thu regime in, in South Vietnam and Saigon, and will instead uh, hope to part the bamboo cur curtain that has long concealed Hanoi's decision making during the war. And I think this is the side that really needs the most telling. But before I jump in, let me just make a brief note of sources, and, and I think this gets to why I feel like the North Vietnamese side uh, that their story really needs the, the most telling. Um, I am the first and only scholar who has gained access to the Vietnam Foreign Ministry archives. Uh, we can talk a little bit about what I was able to see, how I got it, et cetera, if you may. Uh, but basically, I have in my possession highly classified materials that for the first time is able to shed light on top level decision making within the party. In other words, I've been able to piece together a narrative of the complex political intrigue, and there was a lot of it, um, that has managed to, to stay concealed for nearly 40 years. So what I want to do for the remainder of my talk is share with you this new narrative uh, by first addressing who Le Zuan was and how he rose to power. Then I'll lead you through how he steered the country uh, to war. And finally, I'll analyze the limits of his strategy and the nature of his victory. By doing so, I might challenge, I, think I, definitely, I will challenge much of, much of the received wisdom regarding not only Hanoi's war, but of the Vietnam War more generally. <coughs> but who was Le Zuan, and how did he manage to dominate policy making in Hanoi? So in terms of his background, he was born Le Vang Yuan, uh, in the middle region. Um, he's very much like most of the other revolutionaries of his generation at the time. Uh, he got involved in anti-colonial agitation at a very young age. He joined the, um, the, the Vietnamese Communist Party in the, in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, and most importantly, he was, due to his anti-colonial uh, activities, he was arrested by French colonial forces and imprisoned for several years. This is important because his long stint in the colonial prisons ensured that he would receive a high-ranking position in the party upon his release during the post colonial era. Now, although it was rumored that when he was sprung from his second stint at jail in 1945, he wanted the position as Minister of Defense in Hanoi, the party instead sent him to the South, in what I call the Wild South. So right at the end of, of the Second World War, um, he had this unenviable post of heading operations for the party in this wild region. And I call it wild because during the 1940s and much of the 1950s, this area was really up for grabs. Not only was the Communist Party weak in the Mekong Delta, but there were other rival nationalist groups and powerful Buddhist sects um, in addition in, to the communists. Moreover, communist leaders didn't really all get along and their cells weren't necessarily taking orders from Hanoi. So it would take a very resourceful leader to pacify this area for Party Central. This is important because I think the Wild South really did a lot to shape Le Zuan's cutthroat leadership style. Um, and he would you know, use this when he returned north in the 1960s. Um, and he would pretty much implement this sort of cutthroat uh, style leadership throughout his career, throughout the American War and the period afterwards for the remainder of his career. In the immediate period, however, when the South remained under colonial and then neo-colonial control, Le Zuan's dozen years spent in the region also shaped his goal. And that was, pictured here, is a revolutionary pamphlet in which he called for the war, basically a uh, revolutionary war to liberate the South. That was what uh, he had called for. That would be his raison d'etre pretty much throughout the 60s and 70s. And his rallying cry once he returned up north in 1957 to assume the highest seat of power uh, in Hanoi. But under what conditions did Le Zuan return to Hanoi and take the number one party position as General Secretary of the Vietnam Workers' Party? And here I make a rather controversial argument. I argue that the party in Hanoi approved armed conflict in the South to go to war to deflect in part from domestic problems that were taking place in the North. So like the Ziem regime, and we know all about the Ziem regime's uh, state building problems, the North Vietnam Party, Communist Party in Hanoi, also struggled with state building in the period following the French Indochina War. I don't have a lot of time to, and we can address this in Q&A, briefly from 1953 to 1956, 
the party implemented a disastrous land reform and party organizational rectification campaign that ended with the Northern Army, General Baldwin Zapp's Northern Army, uh, having to fire upon the masses, the people to put down demonstrations and uprisings to the party's uh, policies in the countryside. This land reform debacle prompted the Politburo to clean house from within, <coughs> and many of the top leaders lost their seats, um, not their lives, lost their seats, and Deng Jin, and I'll have a picture of him in the next slide, the general secretary at the time, was forced to step down. This was what allowed Lei Zuan to rise to power, I argue. Since Lei Zuan was the only Politburo member untainted by the land reform campaign, he was again in the, in the Mekong Delta uh, for this period, his colleagues recalled him back north to Hanoi to replace Jung Jin. Picture there. Uh, basically, to replace Jung Jin. Um, and you know, this is also revealing again Ho Chi Minh is sort of standing looking like he's sort of in charge, but it's really Deng Jin the entire time of the French Indochina War and the period afterwards, um, and then later, of course, uh, Lei Zuan. Deng Jin didn't lose his Politburo seat, uh, but he was no longer general secretary. So basically, the party not only wanted a new leader, a new face to represent the party, but they also <coughs> wanted a new campaign that could rally the people to support the party's leadership once again. So I argue, what better than a revolutionary struggle in the South to deflect from domestic problems in the North? Now what's important is this is not to say that his comrades in the party, in the Politburo, wanted a full-scale war in the South that could jeopardize what, was, what they were doing in, in the North, which was socialist development of the Northern economy. Instead, they passed what would be a tepid green light, a hesitant green light, to allow communists and the forces in the South to, to finally pick up arms and not just uh, engage in political agitation. So even though Lei Zuan was voted in as general secretary, there were still powerful forces uh, north and south of the 17th parallel that stood in the way of Lei Zuan's goals, which I argue was to wage a total war for liberation in South Vietnam under the direction of the Communist Party in Hanoi. And let's just address a bit of, of who they are. At first, at first, most importantly, there was General Wang Zap and Ho Chi Minh. Now, I contend that these two moderate leaders, since they had been pretty much front row seats uh, during the French Indochina War, they didn't want another full-scale war effort so soon after the struggle for decolonization just ended. Rather, they knew that they had to support some sort of limited uh, armed conflict in the South, in addition to political agitation, until a better solution could present itself. But the worst thing was to, to rush headlong into a total war. On the other end of the spectrum, there were Southern revolutionaries who had already begun to take matters into their own hands, as evidenced by uh, this uh, pamphlet that was later on published in 1965, but by Colonel Wing Thi Lim at the time, entitled No Other Road to Take. Basically, there was no other road to take than to pick up arms. She was a Southern uh, liberation fighter. They basically forced, in this argument, forced Hanoi uh, to support the war. Now, Lei Zuan, of course, as we know, had a front row seat to what was going on at the Southern Struggle right before he returned up north. And so he understood that if Hanoi didn't move to the forefront of this revolution, it could either lose it entirely to Ngo Dinh Diem's uh, troops, or possibly, e e uh, possibly even equally worse, uh, to rival factions, even purportedly communist ones in the South. Now, unlike the Politburo and Southern revolutionaries who understood that taking military action was unavoidable, there were many mid-level party and urban professionals in the North who wanted nothing to do with launching a Southern war, uh, such as Huang Minjin, pictured here. Uh, perhaps who, he was, you know, basically Huang Minjin was perhaps the most famous North firster uh, at the time. He became the number one political dissident until his death uh, a few years ago. Instead, he, and others wanted the party to focus the North's resources into developing the DRV economy, the Northern economy, to detain a full <laughs> socialist revolution before the idea of reunification with the South could even, or should even, be broached. Finally, like the North Firsters, neither Beijing nor Moscow wanted Hanoi to reunify the war, uh, reunify the country through war. Moscow basically just overall lacked interest in the Vietnamese conflict, while Beijing had already just funded 80% of uh, Vietnam's recent war against the French. They both advised Hanoi to keep their southern revolutionaries in check 
and focus instead on political struggle, even though the Zian regime, as we know, refused to hold general reunification elections. So as you can see, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, Hanoi's war was not a <coughs> foregone conclusion. Nonetheless, by the end of 1963, at the historic Ninth Plenum, party leaders gave Le Zuan carte blanche to launch a full-scale war to liberate the South, just as Congress would give LBJ with the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. We know, thanks to the tremendous efforts of historians like Fred Logeval and others, how LBJ chose war, but we don't know how Le Zuan managed it. How did Le Zuan manage to get his country quagmired in the South? First, by 1963, the Sino-Soviet split was official, and Mao now supported violent revolution in the Third World as a contrast to Khrushchev's line of peaceful coexistence. This meant that Ali Zwan had the foreign backing he needed. Although he never went as far as to publicly denounce Khrushchev, that would have been an idiotic move. Uh, perhaps Vietnam would need Soviet aid at a later date. He did basically abandoned Hanoi's policy of equilibrium, which they had been practicing up to that point, and leaned Hanoi closer to China. While Le Zuan played it safe by refraining from criticizing the Soviet Union, he was much less conservative when it came to his domestic opponents. By promoting what I call the party apparatchiks, Le Zuan built a basis of support that allowed him to control pretty much all levers of decision making in Hanoi. With the help of this right-hand man, Le Duc Tha, you would recognize him, of course, from the Paris negotiations with Kissinger. By 1963, Le Zuan possessed a coterie of deputies to ensure that no one could challenge his war policies. Very similar to the ways in which Nixon and Kissinger were able to reroute policy making to the White House, Le Zuan and Le Duc Tha were able to do the very same thing in Hanoi by rerouting policy making to the General Secretariat. In fact, I'll draw a few more similarities with, the Nixon's, or with Nixon's war as we proceed. The first order of business for the apparatchiks was to silence Ho and to sideline Zap, both men um, who basically heavily opposed Le Zuan's bid for total war in late, late 1963. With Ho, Le Zuan browbeat the aged leader into silence. Apparently at the plenum, Le Zuan forced Ho to abstain from the vote to go to war. Ho was going to vote no to go into all-out war. And he did this by using what has been called the theory of two mistakes, that Ho made two mistakes in 1945. The first was to engage in negotiations, failed negotiations, negotiations with the French that gave away the southern half of the country. And the second mistake was to dissolve the Indochinese Communist uh, Party at the time. These were very, very controversial and unpopular decisions. With Zap, Blaise Wan used the powerful General Wing Ji Tan, um, who was not only Zap's main rival in the military leadership, but Tan was also head of the army political department. This is important because in this position, he was able to police Zap's forces. Now, Zap was always a proponent for modernizing uh, the conventional army, to modernize the, the, the People's Army in North Vietnam. General Tan was all about policing, making sure that they were good communists, uh, first and foremost. When Tan died in 1967, he replaced Tan with General Vang Ding Yung. Vang Ding Yung was below Zap, but very jealous of, of the hero Dian Bien Phu and just used the opportunity um, to, to jump forward and, and uh, offset Zap. So basically, we can compare the silencing of Ho and the sidelining of Zap, I think, as what Nixon and Kissinger did, particularly to Secretary of State uh, Bill Rogers and the State Department, and to a lesser extent, uh, Secretary of Defense Mel Laird and, Laird and the Pentagon. Again, we can get more in, into that in Q&A. I kind of like drawing the historical analogies, because when you're dealing with a sort of um, different culture, different personalities, uh, it's very easy in a sort of shorthand way for, for you to have a you know, good context. So not content with just neutralizing key opponents in the top level leadership in the Politburo and among the military brass, Le Zuan also knew that he needed to keep a lid on any general dissent amongst the masses. Um, remember, the one that the, the event that had um, removed Zheng Jin from power was the land reform campaign in which the people rose up in defiance. So he definitely wanted uh, to prevent that from happening <coughs> with the war. Here he relied on this man. Zheng Guquan. Uh, this Zheng Guquan was the Minister of Public Security whose security forces, the Gaomang and the Baobei, operated very much like the KGB. Um, they basically had 
free reign to uh, surveil uh, both the, the party, the military, as well as the general population. And I guess in this way, one can compare Juan and the ministry um, to Nixon's domestic espionage campaign that involved, of course, as we all know, wiretapping and other illegal measures, especially under um, the, the Houston plan. But again, is a, is a shortcut way to think about it. By uncovering the role of Huang and his ministry, I was able to put forth a compelling argument that Lei Zuan built what can only be described as a police state. This is something, of course, we do not think about when we think of North Vietnam, but I think uh, my research shows that it was. In other words, there was really no room for dissent in Lei Zuan's police state. Dissent meant treason. Treason meant arrest. Arrest meant being sent to uh, labor camps in, in the provinces. Finally, with northern op opponents, and foreign talents and talents is checked. Lei Zuan's reach also stretched all the way to the revolutionary movement in the South. Again, the conventional story is that the northern and southern revolutionaries, communist troops, worked together. They were unified in fighting the Americans. But what I showed that, in fact, there was much more discord uh, between uh, northern party members and southern revolutionaries. By re reanimating his old unit, the Central Office of South Vietnam, or COSVIN, Lei Zuan subjugated the Southern Communist leadership. Beginning in 1963, under General Tan and Fat Hom, Hanoi saw to it that the South would not lead its own war for liberation. Now that Lei Zuan secured the party's approval for, armed co for, for total war and assured that no faction could question his command, Lei Zuan then turned to devising a politico-military strategy that he thought would lead communist forces to victory. And this is what he, what he called the general offensive, general uprising, and this is what he drew upon. First, he saw that the cities were the linchpins for success. During Hanoi's glorious 1945 August Revolution, the party was able to, without much bloodshed, seize power and occupy important public administration buildings in the capital, which set off similar actions in cities and towns across Vietnam. Second, he saw that in the Battle of, of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, that the masses working alongside the troops held the power to overcome staggering military odds and endure much sacrifice to win. And finally, Lei Zuan also drew from foreign inspiration. He appropriated aspects of Mao's three-stage process of people's war, Soviet proclivity for large-scale battles set in the cities, and even Cuban folk warfare using paramilitary groups in the cities to incite a mass insurrection. The result was the General Offensive General Uprising, GOGU for short, which called upon communist forces to launch a series of coordinated, large-scale attacks aimed at the cities and towns across South Vietnam, which would in turn um, inspire the masses to rise up and topple the Saigon regime. Hopefully this will sound very familiar to everyone uh, in this room, because this is, of course, what he does in, in 1968. But I'm going to show that he didn't try once, but he, in fact, tried <coughs> three times to use the strategy. Uh, to lead communist forces to victory, and each time he failed. But as I said, to Lei Zuan's dismay, history didn't repeat itself, and the appropriation of foreign models didn't translate to local successes. Lei Zuan's first stab at victory occurred right after that, that crucial 1963 9th plenum, and so he implemented in 1964 when he ordered General Tan to, quote, go for broke and topple the Saigon regime. However, just as Ho and Zap and other military leaders feared Lei Zuan's strategy resulted not in the fall of Saigon, but instead it prompted American intervention. Lei Zuan's second stab, as I just mentioned, came in 1968 after three years of amassing heavy casualties fighting the Americans, although I don't have time to go into detail here, but I'd happy, be happy to do so in Q&A. Uh, basically, there's a huge backstory behind the 1968 Tet Offensive, which we didn't know about uh, initially, and that was there was a large-scale purge in 1967, in which Lei Zuan managed to silence his domestic critics, which included, again, Ho, Zap, and other peaceniks in the party and the military, as well as silence his foreign allies, who at that time were just kind of giving him opposing advice. And he did this by enacting a large-scale purge. Hundreds of party officials and professionals in Hanoi were arrested in 1967, and the objective of that purge was to launch the General Offensive General Uprising in 68. Now, although, as we know, the Tet Offensive managed to strike a huge political psychological blow against the United States, it didn't achieve its primary aim, and that was to topple the Saigon regime, and instead it set back the communist war effort a good three years with the southern insurgency pretty much wiped out, the infrastructure wiped out. And finally, his third attempt was 1972 with the Easter Offensive, and this was done in a, you know, was a revised General Offensive, General Uprising, 
uh, scheme, and it was done in an increasingly different um, uh, international environment. The general secretary uh, basically launched this Easter offensive right between Nixon's visits to Beijing and Moscow. By 1972, I contend that Hanoi uh, not only had to deal with bickering Chinese and Soviet patrons, but it also had to compete with Washington for Beijing and Moscow's favor. Both allies uh, hollowly condemned American actions when Nixon launched his retaliatory uh, action with Linebacker One and only supplied Hanoi with weaponry to defend itself against U.S. bombs, but not the much needed assistance Hanoi needed to continue its, its offensive in the South. This is what it wanted. Um, so basically, Le Zuan's third attempt uh, at the GOGU enabled his allies to carry out Nixon's superpower offensive, and that was basically to apply pressure on Hanoi to accept American terms at the Paris negotiations, negotiations and quit this attempt to win the war through military means by trying to topple uh, the Saigon regime. So quickly, if Le Zuan didn't achieve victory on his own terms, what sort of victory did he achieve over the United States? I mean, it is clear that North Vietnam won the war. Did he defeat the United States militarily on the battlefield? As you can see from my presentation, the answer would be no. Uh, Le Zuan didn't set out to defeat the United States militarily, uh, nor did he think he could have never entertained that thought. Instead, his focus, as I said, was always on defeating Saigon's forces. He basically wanted to uh, present Washington with a fait accompli, a trouncher puppet uh, regime in, in the South, so pack up and go home. Did he win the political war for the hearts and minds of the, of the South Vietnamese people? Well, no, here too. Although it's clear that Washington and Saigon clearly lost the political battle, Hanoi didn't necessarily win it either. Due to Le Zuan's policy of subjugating the Southern Revolution and compromising the communist infrastructure during Tet, it might be fair to say that towards the you know, second half of the war, that those caught in between US South Vietnamese forces on one side and the North Vietnamese army on the other just wanted the war to end. Finally, did he manage to negotiate Thieu Hue? And here the answer is no. Although removing Thieu was one of the crucial terms that Le Duc put forward with Kissinger early on in the negotiations, Pa and Le Zong were forced to concede this point by the end thanks to Chinese and Soviet pressure, as I alluded to earlier. So if Le Zong's strategy didn't work, um, it didn't end with Saigon's collapse in 64, 68, or 72, and none of these other metrics for success could be called victories, just what do I mean when I argue that Hanoi emerged victorious and the war for peace? In other words, what sort of victory did Hanoi achieve over the United States? I argue that by using revolutionary tactics on a global stage, this included utilizing what I call small power tactics, uh, revolutionary diplomacy, as well as transnational people's diplomacy, Hanoi was able to insulate itself from Nixon's superpower machinations in two key ways. First, although Nixon was able to get the Chinese and the Soviets to pressure Hanoi, neither ally fully sold out on the, new, the North Vietnamese cause. I argue that Hanoi consciously set out to shield itself from big power betrayal by using intermediaries like the Cubans and East Germans, uh, so on and so forth, uh, to pressure Moscow and Beijing to toe the ideological line. There was this thing as sort of revolutionary street, street creds in the communist camp. So there was a line that, Hanoi, uh, that Moscow and Beijing couldn't step over. Second, Hanoi's world campaign and people's diplomacy succeeded in ensuring that the United States could never secretly escalate the war again after 1973. Particularly, Vietnamese communist diplomats were, were really adept at, at garnering world public opinion against Nixon's Christmas bombings in late 1972. So in short, Hanoi's war proves that a quote unquote diplomatic revolution occurred, and that's to borrow uh, Matt Connolly's argument, um, that it did take place and it took place in Vietnam. What is surprising, however, is that Le Zuan never actually understood what he had in the diplomatic struggle and the potential of this, of this power uh, to really to, to win the war. So in many ways, he actually put the diplomatic struggle on the back burner. Um, it was noted that he and Le Duc Tha were famous for saying that quote, diplomacy could never replace military uh, strength, unquote. However, I contend that the exact opposite comprised really the crux of, of Hanoi's victory over the United States. So to conclude, I want to just leave you, and this will wrap up my, my very, you know, I unfortunately probably detailed talk, but I want to leave you with the, with the following scenarios. And this will summarize what I think I'm, I'm trying to say. Imagine this. What if our understanding of the American Revolution took no notice of what was going on with King George in London? What if our histories of World War I left out Kaiser Wilhelm's uh, imperial actions 
and its impact on the European balance of power, and perhaps the most striking example, what if our histories of World War II only glossed over the nature of Hitler's Third Reich? I think this is basically what was happening in the case with the Vietnam War, and I hope that my presentation today and my book will start to redress that. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for question and answer. I think by tradition here, if I'm not mistaken, we try to uh, give the floor to a grad student or two to kick things off, and then we'll take it from there. Um, so if you have a hand up, I'll assume you're a grad student. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I just had a question concerning um, like sources you use for, for, like, for building this narrative, how you go about uh, reconstructing Rezuan's motivations. Did you like, use diaries, interviews? Um, or if you just talk about the general actually going to the archives, just the experience of that. Um, it's a good question. Thank you, because this is something I want to address, but I didn't feel like I had time. Um, briefly, the, the archival landscape um, is, is pretty... Um, it's, a, it's pretty treacherous. It's pretty kind of difficult terrain to, to master. Uh, currently, the three archives that would reveal the most about high-level decision-making, the party, the foreign ministry, and the military archives, are closed. And they're closed not only to foreign scholars, they're closed to Vietnamese scholars as well. Only party functionaries, those in the Ministry of Defense, in the foreign ministry, in the party, can access um, those materials. So I lucked out and got into the foreign ministry archives. Uh, so even though those archives are closed, the national archives um, are open. Uh, they're controlled by the Ministry of the Interior, which used to be the Ministry of, of um, or, no, the Ministry of the Interior. And that includes all the state apparatus, um, materials, and collections. Uh, so you can really uh, write a good social history of, of the Vietnam War using Archive Center number three in Hanoi. So I was able to, do, to go to those archives, the foreign ministry archives, um, as well as the archives in the South, which hold the farm, former RBN archives. So that was the archival materials I looked at. In addition to archives, there are these things called the um, academic libraries associated or affiliated with uh, the three bodies that don't open their archives to the general public, so the party, farm, ministry, and military archives. I access the libraries. Uh, they do include primary sources. Aside from those, there are these things called um, limited circulation, closed circulation texts. Um, I was able to get my hands on those, actually thanks to the Cold War International History Project. Um, they were in Vietnamese, so th th at that point, uh, when they were given to Jim Hirschberg, who knows Russian and other languages, I think Russian, only Russian, but that's, a, that's big, uh, didn't know what, what he had when he was given this closed circulation text, which amounted to a diplomatic chronology. Uh, chronologies are important because these entries for these almanacs, you know, what happens every day, um, are pulled from these archives. And what Jim and Quip had was this diplomatic chronology in five volumes. Volumes four and five, which cover the period from 68 to 75, um, were the only ones that had anything of value. The previous ones were all just sort of culled from media outlets. But volumes four and five included direct messages, te telegrams, communication between Hanoi, the Politburo in Hanoi, and the Paris uh, delegation. So direct messages between Le Zuan and Le Bittal. And they talked about everything from meetings with the Chinese and the Soviets to what they thought about Nixon. I mean, this was, I, I liken it to the Pentagon Papers. So in addition to these closed circulation texts, which include these, these, uh, these chronologies, they also have closed speeches. And I was able to get, um, it's no longer in print, uh, no, it's actually not published. It was published in 75 in the North and then hasn't been circulated since. And that was uh, the Minister of Public Security, Jim Kokang's speeches to his ministry. And this is where he talks about waging this counter-counter-revolution. We need to get these guys who are singing what's called gold music, gold yellow music, which was illegal at the time. These groups are basically working to overthrow, um, they call it overthrow the Ho Chi Minh government. So he's seeing all these traitors in the mix, and he's like, we need to nip these campaigns in the butt. And that's how I know the extent to which warriorness existed in North Vietnam. Um, so his closed speeches are called closed circulation texts. In addition to those, um, I accessed, um, I also did interviews with, with, um, with folks like Wang Min Jin, um, the top diplomatic historian Lu Bang Lai, uh, and others. Uh, so in, in addition to the interviews, I also consulted the official local um, and national uh, histories and biographies and reminiscences, which basically add color data to, to um, 
you know, the, the information we can't get from, from Western sources. And in particular, one memoir, one biography, which I really thought was very useful and I enjoyed reading it, was the memoir of Les Wan's second wife. He had two wives. And the second wife was a Southern revolutionary, a very important figure in her own right, and she really lets me kind of bring him to life. He's a three-dimensional character by the end of it and not just a sort of this automaton. Um, so those were the sources I used. Hi, uh, Brandon Archuleta, I'm a first year grad student. Your narrative is one of a very uh, deliberate strategy for a road to war, following Mao's three phases. Did you expect to find that? Were you surprised by it? And what it what is it about the strategy for the war in, in North Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the, uh, the Southern revolutionaries? Do you think that sets it apart from what we're seeing in Iraq and Afghanistan? I'll do my best with this question, especially the second part of which uh, I will say at the, far, at the outset I am not an expert in, in what's going on with the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. But in terms of, of Mao's three-stage um, uh, process, uh, strategy, people's war, this is what Hanoi tried to use during the French Indochina War, and it failed. I mean, there was so much debate by 1954 was Dien Bien Phu, that final stage, there are three stages. The first stage is uh, defensive war, in which the forces are supposed to be on a sort of defensive posture uh, using guerrilla warfare. The second stage is a stage of equilibrium, in which you know it's, it's a sort of holding stage in which both sides are, are of equal power. And then the third stage is this general counteroffensive stage in which the revolutionary troops are, are in, a, in a better position. They launch an, a, an offensive and, and win the war. The debate in Hanoi by 1954 was, did we ever reach that third stage with Dien Bien Phu? Well, the answer is no, because that took place in a, just a small section in the northwest territory of, of North Vietnam. And so there was a lot of debate and a lot of, of mudslinging and finger pointing because it, it didn't win the war in terms of liberating um, the South. And so, uh, you know, they, Lei Zuan knew he couldn't use Mao's, like strictly just use it um, without doctoring it up at all. And so his, his response really was including this sort of political agitation. Uh, in, and, and, and the reason why is because he saw what happened in 1945 and, and 1954, um, as well as borrowing from, from other foreign uh, models. And I think that was sort of his, his reasoning because he knew that, oh, and the person who took most of the blame was, was Zap for launching these very costly human waves um, offenses uh, starting in 1950 at the border region that, you know, he was heavily criticized for that. So that's sort of the, the I mean, I knew I would find something, but I didn't know exactly um, how this, this would work out. But by reading sort of closely how he described this general offensive general uprising, it was clear that, you know, that there were, you know, he was alluding a bit to, to Mao's three-stage uh, process war, but there was something very Vietnamese, very distinct <coughs> about it. Um, in terms of, of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, one of the, the, the op-ed that, the piece that I wrote, I think that there are, um, there are certain limits to what one can say about sort of, you know, the, the, the uh, similarities that, that, that exist. But one of the things that I found quite striking was that these um, pre-fire zones uh, were very similar uh, in Vietnam to, uh, to the drone strikes. And, and so, I mean, I think that what we can do in terms of, of, of history is um, that, you know, kind of know the limits of, of the analogies and, and try to find useful ones. Of course, you can pluck them out of thin air and, and, and argue them which way you want, which is basically what happened with Lou Sorley, Bob Sorley, uh, and Gordon Goldstein. You know, basically the, the, the White House is going to read what it wants to read and use certain sort of lessons in the way that, that it wants to. Hi, uh, can you discuss the, the end of the war? Because it seems that the United States pretty much defeated itself. Because didn't the Nixon, Kissinger's, the detente with the Soviets, the opening of China, which is quite miraculous, and the Operation Linebacker, the Christmas bombing, didn't that bring the North to come to a ceasefire, which would have ended, ended the war, held the line, and to only be thwarted by a Democrat Congress, which started the war, then turned around and defunded the war after the 74 elections and Watergate, thereby losing the war. And I think that's perfectly illustrated by um, Democrat Senator Fulbright of Arkansas, who was asked after the fall of Saigon, I'm no more disturbed than if Arkansas lost a football game to Texas. That was the great conclusion of the Vietnam War, which I think is obscene. Mm -hmm. I'd like your thoughts on that. I should have asked everyone to introduce themselves. I apologize. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> from uh, from Austin. Um, 
I would say that that you know that I I am not at all saying that there weren't uh, very important um, domestic political considerations that the Nixon administration had to take into account. But what I'm doing um, in my book is showing that. In many ways, one can argue Vietnamese actions also shaped American behavior, so that it, you can't just look at what was going on in the United States in Congress in the streets to say, you know, this was how the war unfolded, and um, you know, it would have turned out no differently. It didn't matter what the Vietnamese uh, were doing. Uh, I think one example we can take is, is sort of, um, you know, uh, Le Zouan's go for broke strategy in 1963. Um, that really, you know, paved the way for the Americans, um, for LBJ to intervene. Uh, you know, that Lays Juan wanted to implement this, this very risky strategy, even though his advisors were telling him not to, because it will do just precisely that, introduce the Americans into the equation. In terms of, of the end of the war and, and your question, um, you know, I, I think that, that Hanoi really laid the foundation for uh, domestic opinion in the United States. Congress, uh, the anti-war movement in general, uh, to really, you know, this was again something they knew they didn't, they didn't, um, unfortunately, they didn't rely on due to what happened during the French Indochina War, in which, you know, sort of you can lose what you won on the on the battlefield by negotiating in Paris, but they didn't know that basically, um, in fact, this could bind the hands of, of the Nixon administration. So I think that, you know using uh, what I call small power uh, actions, transnational people's diplomacy. Um, Vietnam basically, you know, kind of put this, this war on the world stage so that by the time uh, Nixon came um, to office, there was really no way that, that the United States could, could re-escalate the war. And I think that one can't take the Vietnamese equation out of this. And this isn't even to say I, I, didn't, I didn't address uh, Saigon. I think the Saigon regime is also very important when you under when you want to understand how Nixon uh, waged war because the Saigon government at every turn was trying to frustrate Nixon's plans. Um, you know they tried to torpedo the negotiations. Um, they they in, in many ways it was very funny. Uh, the Saigon government felt like it was in the same boat as as the party um, you know as Hanoi because they're like we don't want detente with the Soviet Union or China. This is going to mess up everything. We're going to get traded. South Vietnam will be traded for China. Um, so again, the South Vietnamese did everything they could uh, to to frustrate uh, Nixon in, in those ways. And although in the end Nixon did what he wanted to do, I think the timing and the pace of U.S. withdrawal in many ways was shaped by by the Saigon. Uh, regime and one could look at sort of the transcripts of the negotiations in which you know Nixon would reprimand Kissinger because it's like I'm not selling out Pew. We need to do this for him. We need to bomb Hanoi uh, in 1972, and this will also get to uh, back on on track. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, I am Hawaii and I am Vietnamese student from Saigon. And thank you so much for the very interesting books. Uh, Book, I see you write quite a lot about the North process and South first, and I want to ask you about the sources you write about the story of this. Is uh, come from uh, what's most uh, what is the most important resources? Uh, is it uh, the Wang Linting memoir interview and all the documents? Do you have any documents from officer? Uh, Vietnamese documents from uh, military of uh, um, foreign affairs or something else. And the uh, second question is, um, and uh, you said uh, Lezun was the architect main strategist and commander in chief in North Vietnam war effort. And uh, in Vietnam view, we see um, um, American War or Vietnam War is uh, from 1954 to 1957. So could you please tell us about your view? What time is uh, Lezun um, are the main man in chief of North Vietnam effort? And I I think this is quite an important question because um, if you think at the beginning, uh, it's before 1960. If um, it's related to uh, origin of the war and there's 
is the main character in the war, and the third person is um, quite a details in the book. In the play um, 43, uh, I'm sorry. Very <laughs> close. <laughs> 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 yeah. You could pursue with Kang after the talk. Would that be okay? okay. If, if they're really detailed. Oh, ones. oh, it's um, not quite a detail, but um, you talk about 15 uh, re resolution. Uh, it's a lesson, 15 uh, resolution, but uh, Hoang Tung, and uh, according to Vietnamese, is uh, the writing of this resolution is Vong Nguyen Zap. So it means that Vong Nguyen Zap and the north of Vietnam, they are not the north first. Uh, so some some ideas with that. Okay. Okay. We can Oh, you go. Yeah. Quick questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we can talk in further detail quickly. Yes. Uh, the, with the first one, yes, I did get a lot in terms of, of, of interviews, um, as well as, uh, you know, with Brian Minjin, who has passed away, um, and, and attending these closed conferences, in particular one about the North, uh, about the uh, NLF, the National Liberation Front, which, you know, the, it, it has been published. Uh, in two volumes, but a lot of the things I was told was sort of off the record during lunch breaks about sort of, you know, the extent to which the party in the North uh, forced the South to do X, Y, and Z, so off the record, of course. But, but there, there have been published materials, so you can verify a lot of my arguments about um, sort of what was, was going on, in particular with this extent of, of war weariness, which, I, which is what I'm, I'm getting in terms of your question, because Huang Minjin was the was arrested in that 67 purge. He was the first arrestee. It was called the Anti-Party Affair or the Huang Minjin Affair. Um, and that is the official history of, of the Bao Bay. Uh, so this is the security forces within the military. Uh, Gaomang is, is the Ministry of the Public Security, but Bao Bay, they work together. And that is actually was published and placed online in a military history website in, North, in Vietnam. And I was able to, and it's been taken off, but I, I have copies of it, and actually one can get it in Vietnam. Um, but it's, it's one of those, it's the official history, and they talk about the anti-party affair and Huang Minjin. So this is the official voice. They talk about sort of this, this, um, this affair that took place. And, but the people, of course, involved in the affair wasn't, you know, they weren't just trying to prevent this large-scale war. They were trying to topple the, the party, and, and that's just not true. Uh, so there have been, you know, unfortunately, they, you know, the, the dealing with Vietnamese official histories, it is very frustrating because a lot of times it is just the official line. But every so often, and here's where you have the sort of track, the, the, what's going on currently in Vietnam, you do have, you know, instances in which cracks open and uh, certain volumes, uh, certain articles are, are published. And oh, another example of this is in 1988, on the, after the death of, of uh, Les Juan in 86, uh, and with the, uh, at that time, that would have been the anniversary of the Tet Offensive, 20th anniversary, they started publishing about how that was a, that was a wrong decision, that Les Juan cost them a lot of, of, of men and, and materiel. Um, so, so there are instances in which you can get at this other history um, that, that's sort of lurking there, but you kind of have to pick it up and, and, and read it and, and then, you know, kind of do something with it. In terms of your second question, and again, uh, briefly and quickly, um, okay, so Le Zwan didn't return until sometime in 1957 uh, to Hanoi. And at that point, the person who was given the, the task of drafting Resolution 15 was Vong Nguyen Zap. Ho Chi Minh gave it to Vong Nguyen Zap. Resolu Resolution 15, the thing that gave the, the tepid green light to war in the South. Zap was, a, was, was in charge of that. When Le Zwan came back up north, he said, give it to me. And I'm sure there was some sort of scuffle, like, no. Uh, but Ho, Ho Chi Minh um, did have to weigh in. And I think at this point, this is when it became like, look, we need a new face uh, to, to lead the party, new policies. You know, Ho said, give it over to, to Comrade Le Zwan. And so Le Zwan, in fact, home went through 15 different drafts of this Resolution 15. So by the end of it, it was no longer Zapp's resolution, which we don't know what it would look like had it been Zapp's resolution. Um, but the resolution as it stands, Resolution 15, was a product of Fat Home and, um, and Le Zwan ushering it through all these different committees and getting that, that draft. And even then, it was still a tepid green light. They couldn't get much more than that. It was until 1963 that he got the sort of, you know, sort of full-scale war that it became no longer sort of the party of northern uh, economic development and southern war. It just became war 
so 19, it wouldn't be until 1963 that I would say Les Juan just was able to set up everything, the party, the, the, the apparatchiks uh, to power the, the, the police state, uh, Cosman in the South, uh, so on and so forth. But he was pretty much doing that from the time he stepped foot in Hanoi all the way to 1963, with 1960 being a very important point because he became official general, general secretary at the time and was able to place his deputies in key positions. If you look at the party statute of 1959 and the third party, uh, and, the, and the Congress of third party, you can see that he's already moving the men in the right position to be able to get to 1963. We can talk more about that. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, so I, first of all, I just wanted to say, hey, how wonderful it is to hear you talk about this. It's a fantastic book, and uh, many of us have had the chance to watch you all slog through all these materials, get these materials you out. Remember my first presentation was that I used to talk like this. You couldn't hear me. I was going like this. I was like, That's, <laughs> not, true. That's not true at all. Because <laughs> I had so much to get. And it's a wonderfully written book. To you. You're able to, for, for someone who's ignorant of Vietnam as I am, you're able to make this all comprehensible for us. So it's really wonderful. My question to you is about the politics of this, though. Um, you, you dug up a lot of fantastic material that no one else has seen, and you deserve uh, all sorts of kudos for that. It's a great service to the profession, as Mark said. Um, but my, my concern is why those materials were made available to you, and who is served by your story. And this is not to in any way uh, question the integrity of your story, but it is to question the politics of archives and the politics of why certain materials are made available. Um, and, and there is a striking way in which your story um, resuscitates a certain image of Ho Chi Minh and attributes a certain blame for things that the Vietnamese regime might want to separate itself from, from a discredited leader. Uh, and this is not particular to Vietnam. Every society, the German government manages its archives. Uh, the Chinese government, of course, manages its archives. The United States does, right? The Lyndon Johnson Library has an interest in a particular image of Lyndon Johnson, right? So this is not uh, in any way to cast aspersions, but um, when, you're, when you're doing this kind of work, there are implications and there are politics behind the access that you're given to things, and I, and I wonder how you've navigated that. And I, and I, I wonder if you might speculate on, on what the Vietnamese government's interest is in allowing you, where they've allowed you, to, to move forward in the way they, they haven't allowed others. I expect that's going to be a very difficult question, but a very important question. You know, um, it's really difficult reading the, the political tea leaves. My best guess is that the reason I was able to get into foreign ministry archives is that the foreign ministry, especially after 1986, this is, this is the advent of the Mei, the renovation policies, is that the, the foreign ministry is the most liberal ministry. Uh, it's sort of the, right after Lei Zuan died, it really did become a sort of much more co eh, collective decision making, or there was a troika which was, you know, there's the prime minister's office, the, the foreign minister and, and the general secretary. Now it's changed a bit. But when I was there, the foreign ministry was hoping to open up to the West, whereas uh, another, uh, you know, but, but defense did it. Uh, the defense ministry didn't want to. They wanted to focus on, on, on rebuilding with China. Um, so those were sort of the, you know, the sort of uh, battling uh, sides. And so I think that, that MOFA, the foreign ministry, wanted to, to sort of get its voice heard. Uh, so that's that's my guess. So I think that it is very important to understand why one gets to see things, and, and that is why it's in many ways you have to be a sort of uh, uh, student of, of, of political science, and, uh, and, and, and you know, in addition to, to history, uh, when you're doing Cold War history uh, and the Vietnam War as it, as it pertains to Vietnam. So that's my guess. In terms of Ho Chi Minh, that's the first time I've heard about this. <laughs> that in fact it's it's to uh, resuscitate uh, this 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 leader, um, this, this you know very revered leader. And in a way, you know, he and Bong Zap are the unsung or heroes of my book. Uh, but it's still a story that no one in Vietnam wants to have out. Um, and so, you know, I I would venture to say no because. If it was something where, and Zap's still alive, you know, in many ways he has the last word. He's the one we all know about, not Lei Zuan. But within Vietnam, it's Lei Zuan's acolytes who still, I mean, all the way up to Bob and Kiev. Um, and even today, again, I've, I've probably been too lax about my political science hat and I should know more about current Vietnamese politics. Uh, but, you know, the empire that Lei Zuan built continued into the 80s and the 90s with, again, like I was saying, his deputies in Kasbin then rising to positions of power. Uh, within within the party and, and the state, 
So within the country, though that, you know, his legacy is still alive. Um, and so I would say, you know, I, I don't know if it's, if it's one of these things where, you know, Vietnam wants the story to come out so that Ho and that look better. They look great there now because stories of this, you know, haven't been as, as prevalent. Back way up in the corner. Yeah, um, Alex wanted to talk a little bit about the end of the war and the final evacuation of, of Saigon. And uh, my understanding from the Nixon Library archives is that um, Kissinger, and actually this is uh, Nixon and Ford archives, or, or some of the materials are in the mix, but that Nixon, uh, especially, no, I'm sorry, that Kissinger especially asked for, uh, through Debrinen, asked uh, the Hanoi leadership to delay uh, the final assault by about a week. And apparently they go along with this and there's just a final push. And I was wondering what would what would the incentives of Lee Zwan or the other leaders would be to go along to accede to this request given this goal of you know completely uh, pushing out the United States. And of course we all know about the horrors of the war and the rhetoric and so we have would have reason to believe that there would be kind of a an aggressive final final push. But instead there's there's this kind of a humanitarian uh, interlude uh, between when the forces are surrounding, and I'm sure you know all about the, you know how this comes about, and then and then and then finally when the, uh, the United States succeeding in evacuating by air and, and by sea, uh, 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 thousands of folks that perhaps might not have otherwise uh, escaped. That's a good question. Again, I don't uh, I don't have the evidence either way, but I would venture to say that you know what what the party was hoping for was was uh, reconstruction aid aid that you know, Nixon had promised, and so it was one of these things where it was clear that Saigon was on the brink of, of collapse, and so what difference would it make, especially if after peace was, was, uh, was, was uh, going to return, that eventually they would need US money. Um, and of course, this is a whole other tragic story that deals with the Ford and then Carter administrations. Um, but basically, that, that would be my response. In terms of, of um, the sort of, you know, the, the real backstory behind that is um, Bang Bingyong, the general that I said replaced General Tan, took total sort of credit for the, uh, the uh, it's called the, the um, what do you call it, the Looming Lotus strategy uh, for 1975 and the Ho Chi Minh campaign. Um, he was very criticized for that. In fact, in 1986, he was one of those swept from power along with, with Do Ho uh, and some of, uh, of, of Lei Zuan's um, um, uh, deputies. Uh, but that, you know, the other backstory is that, that Zap was too timid, and in fact, they could have achieved victory much earlier than April, end of April 1975, but that there was this fear that, you know, maybe the Americans would, would re-intervene, and that the foolish generals didn't know um, that, in fact, no, they could have had victory much earlier, uh, but that was always sort of in the background, and later on, that's sort of the story that gets circulated around that, you know, there were those, and in fact, this is actually the uh, Cospin at this point, the Southerners were like, look, let's not pay attention and abide by the Paris Agreement. You know, we need to, we need to move our, our troops in place, and the North was, you know, supposedly the, the hesitant um, uh, party in, in, in this case. Oh, please. This is a follow-on to Jeremy Suri's question. Do you have any indication that your book has been read in Vietnam? And so, what reaction have you gotten? Um, yeah, it's a good. You know, I have very I have close friends within the the the, uh, the Ministry of Defense and within the Foreign Ministry, and um, I sent my book there uh, to them um, through Lady Borden, who is this was an anti-war activist uh, in the United States in the, in the 60s and 70s, and she's the first US citizen to be granted citizenship in Vietnam, and so she lives there full time. And I gave her a copy, and no one's talking to me about it. <laughs> They'll talk to me about pretty much everything else uh, but the book. But I, I do know through um, some folks who work at, at NGOs uh, in, in Vietnam that it's, it's there. I'm not sure what they're going to do with it. I mean, I've attended many conferences in which, especially one, again, the, this one by the NLF, uh, in which their members are pulling me aside during the, the breaks to say, you're right, you know, proceed with this. They were pressuring us to change our leadership structure in the South, pretty much from 63 to 69. We didn't like what they were doing. They were telling us to send cadre back and forth. It was idiotic. And then in 73, they tell us not to move, so on and so forth. So, you know, there was a lot of this sort of discord, but they, um, you know, they both when you know the official paddle was taking place, and I presented my paper and pulled from you know references from their uh, publications in Hanoi and Saigon. 
you know, they, it was very funny because they, they made the, the official in Hanoi answer my question about, you know, was there all this discord? And he stands up and he says, Go Lin Han, you have to understand that, you know, we were unified in the war. And then my friends in the Southern Revolution, of course, one by one stand up and said, yes, you know, comrade is correct. They we were unified. They don't want to be like, no, no, no. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's that, that's the sort of situation because there is sort of a, still a north-south divide, even in between in terms of resources that Hanoi gets and Ho Chi Minh City gets. And so it's when these divides um, really sort of flare up or tensions flare up that, that I'm able to see a bit more. But I, I'm not sure of the response and I haven't tried to seek entry back in Vietnam. I know there are a lot of questions left. I know I have several myself and I know I'm gonna be unfair in passing over some, so I think we need to wrap this up. But let us say maybe two more questions. Um, there was one here. Hi, I'm Matthew Glenn from the History Department. So I wanna push back to the earlier period. We talked a lot about the end of the war and I find really interesting the parallels you draw between the objective situ situation that Hanoi faces and Saigon did. They seem to be facing many of the same kind of problems. And I wanted to see if you could comment a bit on, because back when we didn't have much about what Hanoi was facing, it was easy to fill in the world's picture of unity. People were happy, they were going along with this, you know, in some way which we didn't, just didn't know about. And if they were facing the same kind of levels of dissent, um, why does, why does, relatively speaking, the North succeed in maintaining the kind of state legitimacy where it's so much more fragmented and fractured in the South? And is it, um, what is the balance of kind of ideological factors and just state oppression in that question? Very good question, good question. Um, that's, you know, um, the problems in terms of land reform uh, and the party rectification campaigns it was known at the time what was taking place. The emigres that, that came to the South talked about, I mean, because land reform was, was beginning in 1953. Um, and of course, the period of resettlement after the Geneva Court, Southerners were saying this was taking place. There were all these kangaroo trials. Neighbors were, were calling out neighbors. People were being executed left and right. It wasn't just landlords, but middle peasants, not small peasants. And so we knew. Um, now, a lot of the numbers are still, it's still kind of, of shady. One of the one of the sources one could pull from in terms of, 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 the, of this though, and I think we will get a clearer um, picture, uh, thanks to Alec Holcombs, a student of Peter Zinnerman at Berkeley, has been piecing together the numbers from Banking Bang, the, the official party documents have started um, sort of releasing some of the numbers of people killed during the land reform, and I can't, I'm terrible with numbers, um, but it talks about sort of, they, you need to kill off 1% of a certain square mileage within a certain countryside. He did the numbers. He came to, uh, I think it was five to 6,000 in the first wave or something like that. The numbers are anywhere from 10,000s to hundreds, but we know it's sort of somewhere in the middle. But in any case, uh, but back to your question. I mean, I, I think, you know, one argument that people put forward is that the South, things are much more open. Political debate is much more open and in the North it wasn't. The French were sort of, uh, you know, the, the center was in Cochin, China, within Saigon. And so you have this, this longer, uh, tradition of, of political debate and dissent, and in the North you didn't have that. Um, so that that's one one sort of thing that's thrown out. I like to say that you know it was much more. Um, you can attribute it more to Lezuan's organizational skills. He built a stronger state than Malaysia. You know, his repression paid off, and you didn't have, you know, you didn't have Soviet. I mean, there were Chinese troops and there were Soviet advisors, <coughs> but not to the extent that you had in the South. Uh, so for many reasons, I mean, it was it was much more. It was it was obvious, I think, that that you would have, uh, you know, the problems in state building on one side be much more um, publicly known than in the other, in a sort of closed community in which you can prevent people from from reporting on it. Final question, Frank Gavin. Oh, I actually um, terrific talk. This is learned so much from it. I, Fascinated by the story of the, uh, you mentioned a couple times, of the northern subjugation of the south, which seems really, really fascinating. And I, I guess I've got two questions about it. One, I'm hearing a little bit more about how it went at the time, <clears throat> how much resistance there was. Uh, but perhaps just as importantly, post-75, I would imagine the historical memory reconstructing what led to victory was probably, was there a dispute between more of a northern-driven narrative and a more sort of 
indigenous insurgency narrative. How did that play out both in terms of historical memory and also in terms of the politics of the nation post-75 post after unification? How were those stresses and tensions, how did they play out politically? Great question. Um, you know, that, that was one of the things. It was <laughs> uh, one, the, 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 the most dominant interpretation was put forward by Carl Thayer and, and my very good friend, Bob Brigham, um, which was that, you know, and, and to some extent, I can maybe agree with this, which was just that the National Liberation Front, the Southern Communist Insurgency, uh, was not wholly autonomous, but, you know, um, they definitely didn't just take orders from Hanoi, that there was this sort of authentic insurgency in the South. And, and that's definitely fair. I, you know, there, I talked to so many Southern uh, communist leaders, and they were definitely operating there before Hanoi came. And in fact, in many ways, Hanoi uh, co-opted some of their victories, especially in the concerted uprising in 19, 1959. They established the NLF afterwards to claim you know, sort of uh, responsibility for that. But it, it was a spontaneous uprising that occurred uh, in the South without, without Hanoi. Um, so, so that that argument does hold true, but by my period, they really aren't autonomous anymore. I mean, there is, and oh, again, another example of a book that talks about this is, is uh, the history of Military Region Nine, in which the official history of Military Region Nine talks about how these northern cadres come south and and try to instill all of these reforms in terms of the party structure and the military leadership, and the South was was going to the South wanted to resist this. Um, so, you know that. In terms of by the time of my period, especially by 1969, and forget about the, the, the period of Paris negotiations, the provisional revolutionary government in which Madame Bin uh, is the foreign minister and head delegate, they were, she even says, I took orders from Lady Ka. Um, you know, we, 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 we sort of, um, and, and she wasn't, I mean, in, in, in terms of, you know, she, there was even no contribution in terms of the strategy. It really was, I will say this. Um, so that's, that's by my period in which the stakes were so high they couldn't really afford any sort of, you know, giving over autonomy. And that's where I, I part ways with, with Bob Brigham and others uh, who say that, no, you know, the Southerners really put pressure on, on the North to negotiate this in terms of the, the prisoners. And so I, I don't agree with that. Uh, in terms of post-75, the problem, the Southerners now take issue that the national history is a Northern history. And that's what they're trying to, to really uh, pick apart uh, within Vietnam right now. And you know they had a very strong advocate involved in Viet, who was who was uh, head of Cos or who was involved in Cosman and very involved in, in Southern affairs with, with Les Wan. Um, and in fact, that conference that took place uh, originally, they wanted um, Gabriel Coco and Noam Chomsky. They got me and John Prados and, uh, <laughs> uh, and Christian Osterman. And so you know we uh, you know that that conference was all about sort of. Decentering the the national um, narrative away from from the north and bringing in sort of southern contributions uh, into uh, into the story, and it's still taking place today. Well, I know we can keep going on and on. I think that's always a sign of a very very successful talk, uh, and maybe it also says something about the Vietnam War, <laughs> the size of that literature. But uh, please join me in thanking. You.